uh, thank you for your patience. And uh, so we've had this like four part thing, and this is now the grand finale of part four. So uh, Ellie made the render and sent it off to me, but also uh, that same stuff can go off to Anna Carolina, who's going to show us a completely different workflow in Unreal, and it's magical. So thanks for being here. Check it out. Hey everybody, thank you so much for being here. I'm very excited to show you a little bit of the workflow between ZBrush and Unreal Engine 5. Uh, as you know, I, this has been a part of a group project with Ian, Ellie, and Chad, and my goal was to create a magical mushroom forest where our friend Axel, the salamander, I think he's a salamander, could live inside of Unreal. So let me take you on a journey today, not only through a magical mushroom world, but from ZBrush to Unreal 5. Today, we're going to talk about how to import your ZBrush meshes to Unreal 5, some basic material setup, and some not-so-basic material setups to, uh, in order to level up your modeling and your, your looks, and some tool creation in Unreal 5 to speed up some boring tasks. So I put together a little trailer for you guys today to kind of see what we're working on and what the final result looks like. Let me just make sure that this is set a little bit higher quality. Thanks, guys. <laughs> so, let's watch it again. Just kidding. So, as a recap for the other three parts of today's presentation. First, Ian Robinson, amazing Maxon ZBrush trainer, showed you how to create Axel and his little clothes and accessories in ZBrush. Then he hopped over to Substance Painter in order to show you how to texture it. Then Ellie gave him a really beautiful Honestly, adorable little home inside of Redshift and Cinema 4D. And Chad just got done, and he was showing you how to use, like, how to color grade and basically take Ellie's work and do some render, render passes on it. So I wanted to introduce myself really briefly before we continue. So I am a VR developer, game developer, and technical artist, um, kind of from a different world than a lot of people here. Uh, in the past, I've done work for companies such as NASA and you know, the Air Force and a bunch of other things, normally serious uh, games and, ex and uh, experiences. Currently, I'm a college professor at the Ringling College of Art and Design down in Florida, teaching in two majors, VR and game arts. Uh, I have my own online education company, and I've worked with multiple amazing, uh, well-known brands. My favorite being Maxon. Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, I do a little bit of everything from character art to, you know, environment art and technical art, coding, development, interactions, and a couple of other things. I'm from Rio, Brazil. That's my cat. It's the funniest picture I have of him. Uh, I just recently started a podcast talking about the VFX industry, games, and things like that. And I interview a bunch of professionals for that. And I'm writing a book on how to level up your career. So, if you're interested in a little bit of what I'm talking today, I recommend checking out these two series from uh, Cineversity, Z Classroom, which are basically how to get started with Max on ZBrush and how to use Redshift in ZBrush. Uh, I'll be doing an in-depth lecture tomorrow on how I created the ZBrush models for today's demo and how I made them modular. So you should come back for that. Um, another series that ta teaches a lot of the basics that I will not be covering today is the demystifying the series uh, that I did with Maxon recently. Uh, it's called Building Unreal Worlds with ZBrush, and you can find it on the Maxon Training YouTube channel. So, why Unreal 5, right? I'm sure you guys, I don't have to tell you guys that Unreal 5 is uh, a very interesting new software because it's kind of where all of the different parts of our different industries are converging. We're all kind of coming towards real time, rendering a little bit at a time. People are doing motion graphics, VFX, entire movies and shows. Uh, interactive experiences, and so on. 
for the ZBrush Summit last year, we created this awesome virtual set for the show. For this year's ZBrush Summit, we invited artists from around the globe to gather in person and stream online live to the community. We asked 3D artist and educator Anna Carolina Pereira to create custom backgrounds, animations, and set props from scratch for a completely immersive virtual experience. Anna and her team used Unreal Engine to construct all aspects of the environment in ZBrush, Substance Painter, and Cinema 4D. The team used Z-Modeler to develop basic primitives into practical assets. Manipulating primitives using Dynamesh allowed for expanded design possibilities. The ceiling tile design incorporated our micro-poly feature. The roses were sculpted by hand using radial symmetry to support consistency across each petal. Anna modeled each tile using Z-Modeler and then applied the shapes using micro-poly. Micropoly in ZBrush replaces polygons with newly constructed secondary shapes or assets. In addition to ZBrush, the team used Cinema 4D to create props for the environments. Scene sculptures were collected from ZBrush Central Artists and processed using ZBrush and the Decimation Master plugin. Statues were baked and textured in Substance Painter, transferring details from high polygon meshes to low polygon meshes. Anna and her team brought the assets into Unreal Engine. They started by blocking out the environments using large primitive shapes, also known as gray boxing. The storyboard process allowed for rapid ideation and concept development while helping to realize a more dynamic scene. A very tight deadline meant most of the production process needed to happen with minimal technical hurdles. There were multiple interactive aspects to this project. The ballerina statue animation reveal, the sculpt off winner painting reveal, and the dissolving effect of the presentation models all added a level of dynamic interaction to the scene. Models were prototyped using rough animations and effects, and finally finished with sound effects. Working within a tight deadline was a motivating factor for the choices made when constructing the primary and secondary assets for the virtual ZBrush Summit. In the end, the flexibility of ZBrush's features propelled our workflow and design decisions. Taking assets from ZBrush to Cinema 4D and Substance Painter was seamless, while expanding the look development of the project. If you want to find out more about how to make assets in ZBrush, check out Anna's Getting Started in ZBrush tutorial on Cineversity. For this year's... Let's watch it again. So, how are, how are we going to create Unreal Worlds with ZBrush today? And more importantly, how are we going to do it faster? As a technical artist, it's one of my missions to always be putting forward the most efficient workflow possible. First, I had to find some inspiration, and I found it in the Sky Skyrim and one of my favorite games, Sea of Thieves. And of course, Ian's character that we are using today. And then I have a specific interest in character creators and like uh, modular creations. So one day I created this like cat generator that has can make like 88,000 cats that are all unique. Um, and so I'm inspired by this as well today. Uh, tomorrow, I'll be doing a lecture on how I made all the mushrooms modular for today. Basically, how I've separated the tops and the bottoms for the, uh, the mushrooms and like, how they're going to work with today's system. Uh, let's skip this video a little bit, but we come back tomorrow. All right. At 1.30. A couple of things in the, in the behind the scenes that we did was, first of all, I had to animate Axel. This was my attempt at that. I am no rigger and no animator, so I went to Mixamo for automatic rigs. Who here has tried that? I know you guys like Mixamo. So um, we gave him some animations, specifically running and idling and jumping. That was no good, and this is much better. Next, I took Ian's models, and I brought them into Unreal and gave them the textures that he created in Substance Painter. And let's go ahead and do that together. So, this is our Unreal project right here. Really standard stuff. I haven't done anything to it at all. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a folder, and I'm going to create a new folder inside just to be able to import Ian's models without creating any conflicts. Because if I accidentally import the same model to the folder, then it might be a problem. So I'm going to start by uh, giving you guys a quick rundown and create a new folder. Um, this here is our main viewport, kind of previews what we're going to see in Unreal 5. This right here is our content drawer. You can open or close it, and it will contain all of your files that you can use to create your scenes and your, your uh, characters and whatnot. Right here, you see a list of every single thing in your scene. And if you click on anything, you'll see the details, kind of like size, textures, and whatnot. I'm going to name my new folder, because it looks like I didn't name it properly. So I'm going to call this one Scanner. And we're going to bring in the scanner that Ian made with uh, the hard surface tools inside of ZBrush. Let me go ahead and get that open. So 
he has already shown us how to export things out of ZBrush. This is a file that he made for us. It's an FBX file, and it contains the actual model itself. I'm going to simply, oops, <laughs> I'm going to simply drag that in, or not. Drag that in. Sometimes you got to give it a little wiggle before it works, and then I'm going to import it. So I'm going to keep all of the options exactly the same as we normally do, and I'm going to hit import all. There we go. Looks like my content browser decided to jump ship here. So let me go ahead and just kind of dock it back down. Oops. There we go. Hopefully now it'll stop jumping around. And there is the scanner right here. This is a static mesh uh, kind of asset, and it has a material that's been pre-made. But since there were no textures applied to it already, then there are no textures in here for us. I'm going to go ahead and double click the scanner and check it out. So right off the bat, we can tell that it's a little tiny. And this can happen sometimes. Um, one thing you can do is inside of ZBrush, you can increase the scene scale. Or in here, you can just search for import options. Import. And find some import scale. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. So I'm going like, to maybe multiply the scale by 3 and then re-import. And that will be a little bit bigger for us, something more that I can use in my actual level. Let's go ahead and set up a material for this, because right now it looks kind of uh, bland. So I'm going to take my, my, my uh, window, and I'm going to dock it up here. So right now we're just setting up the, the model. I could even drag it into my world by simply clicking and dragging. It's kind of still a little small, but let me go ahead and move it by using the gizmo. Just like in most modeling software in Unreal, you're going to be able to use the gizmo by pressing W. E or R, and each one will do a different thing. So E is going to rotate. I'm going to rotate it towards us a little bit. Oop, a little bit of um, motion blur here. It's OK. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the material, and we're going to set up the materials that we have here. A lot of things in Unreal are node-based, and the material editor is no different. So I'm going to import the textures from Ian's model right here that he's already kind of made for me. For me. I'm going to give it a little wiggle, drop it in. And now I can use all these textures to apply to my material. Let me go ahead and grab a material. I'm going to undock it, actually, because I need to be able to see both right now, like so. Let me make this a little bit bigger. And then I'm going to start adding my textures directly to the inputs. So for example, they're already named, named correctly. So scanner, base color, like so. I'm going to drag it in. You're going to see a lot of outputs. We're going to choose the RGB output, and we're going to drag it into the base color. And that should automatically apply our base color to our material. If you want to preview what your model is going to look like, click on your model. And then right here, you get some preview options. Click on the, um, the last one, which looks like a little brick. It is to be a teapot. And then I can press F to frame, just like you would in ZBrush. And then we can kind of see that the texture is already coming together. Let's also add metallic, which in this case is just kind of a black texture. That's going to go right into metallic. Like so. We're going to do roughness. I, like, I try to keep things organized, but sometimes it gets away from me. Roughness, and then the normal map. The normal map, for those of you who don't know, it's a very common technique used in, in games um, and in real-time rendering, in which you take the detail from the high-poly mesh, and then you bake it down into the low-poly mesh in order to like, make it seem like it's high detail, but it's actually totally fake. Uh, it's just a trick of the lights. So once I've done that, I can go ahead and hit Apply. And then I can apply my texture to my model in Unreal. Let me check if it made it. I'm going to tab this up here. Unreal is really good with two screens. So I'm going to put here. It's a little bit blurry. It's my post-processing. Let's take that off for now. Press F to center. And we can see our scanner. It looks pretty good, but I know a secret, which is when you import or uh, different types of textures, sometimes there can be issues, specifically with the roughness and the metallic. You have to open them up, because otherwise your model might look a little too shiny, and that might not be what you want. So you're going to open up the texture, and you're going to turn off sRGB on the roughness and the metallic. And that way, it'll, Unreal will know that this is supposed to be a um, roughness texture that only has the kind of um, black and white in it. It will break the, the material. So let's go back to the material. Big old error right here. 
I'm just going to reapply. I should probably save this first. I'm going to reapply the texture. Oh, it's completely gone now, so let's find it. Scanner, roughness, like so. And now that's looking a little bit better. We can even see the like little smudgy screen that Ian put in here. It's so cute. I really like this model. I'm going to go ahead and save this material. And now it's in use on our model. I don't know if you guys can tell the before and after, but it looks a lot better now. So we definitely want to not forget this sRGB thing. All my students forget it all the time. So I wouldn't judge you if you did. That is kind of the bare bones, super basics of how you would take a model from a software like ZBrush and import it into Unreal with your textures. All right. The most important thing to look out for is scale and pivot point placements. In this case, Ian did a really good job putting the pivot point right in the middle. Be careful not to have your pivot points travel all over the place, you know, be far away um, or in a completely random spot. So we are basically done with that. But I like taking things to the next level. So Ian also made some mushrooms for us today. Demo two. He made these little mushrooms right here. I actually have them in the presentation. And these are the colors that Ian chose for his mushrooms. I really wanted to incorporate them into my project, but the aesthetic doesn't quite match, because I wanted to go for something like cool with pinks and blues, and this is not quite right for me. So what I did in Substance Painter was I used the same file he made, but I turned it into a black and white alpha. That way, I can apply color specifically based on this black and white value. So for example, I can apply blue color to the cap and pink to everywhere that's white. So I already made those maps, and I'm going to show you how to set that up. It's a really nice way to not always be stuck moving between softwares, bringing things into Unreal, and giving the level designer or environment artist more control. So I'm going to, I believe I already have a material in here, but I'm going to make another one. I'm going to name it correctly using the Unreal naming conventions, which is M underscore for material. I'm going to call this one uh, Ian's Mushroom 00. And I'm going to open it up. For now, I'm going to untab because I need to be able to drag in my textures. And it's kind of hard if I don't unt untab. And I'm going to go browse for my textures. I did this offline, but I've already imported them by just dragging them straight in and giving it a little wiggle at the end. And let's go ahead and set it up. So first, I have my base color. I'm going to set that up into the base color input. Next, I think I have my normal map, like so, right into the normal, like so. Then I have roughness, which I believe I've already turned off as RGB. Let's check. There it is. Turned off, perfect. I'm going to go ahead and plug that into roughness, like so. And by the way, this is one of the, those things. Whenever an artist is coming to me and they're like, I need to learn Unreal right now, what do I need to learn? All you need to know is how to import your models, apply a material on there, and maybe light it a little bit as a uh, you know, 3D artist. But if you want to take it farther, then you're in the right place. So the metallic, of course, we're just going to throw it in there, even though it's not metallic at all. I always do that anyway. I'm going to apply. And let's go ahead and put it in the scene. Where's my little mushroom? There it is. It's kind of tiny. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. Bring it up a little. In this case, the ideal pivot placement would be to put it at the base so that it would snap to the floor. Another pro tip that you can do is, as you're placing things and you want them to snap to the floor, just drag it above the floor and press end on your keyboard, and it will take the lowest points of the item and bring it towards the floor. It's not quite perfect in this case, but there it is. And then we're going to apply the new material I just created, Ian's mushroom, to the mushroom. Let it compile for a second. And there we have Ian's adorable mushroom. But like I said, the aesthetic doesn't quite match with the rest of the level. Right, so let's go ahead and elevate this a little bit. I'm going to open him up, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply that black and white texture that I told you about in order to um, basically mask the, the material and be able to apply colors uh, selectively. So let's grab that texture. It's in here somewhere, I believe. <laughs> there it is, the alpha. And I'm going to drag it in. Again, the goal here is to use the white parts to apply one color and the black parts to apply another color. Like I said, the materials, just like coding and Unreal Ink and blueprinting, is a node network. 
which means that we can use a bunch of nodes like multiply, uh, add, mathematical terms, <laughs> general mathematical terms, um, and we can like you know do things like like Photoshop blend layers almost here. What I want to do is I want to use a node called a lerp or a linear interpolate, like so. What this node does is actually pretty fancy. I love it. It's my favorite node. Okay. So what this does is it'll take one input, which is stands for zero, and one input which stands for one. If we use this as the alpha, everywhere that's black stands for zero, and everyone where that's white stands for one, which means that I can mix two things, and I can apply them only in those areas. So I'm going to go ahead and plug that into my base color. Probably going to get an error soon because it does not like it when you don't plug anything in. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to add two colors. Pink and blue is fine for me today. In order to simply add a, a color inside of the material editor, you can press down three and click. Because at the end of the day, this thing is still mathematical, and all a color is a vector, right? A vector is a combination of three floats, RGB in this case, but normally we do XYZ in Unreal. So, and <laughs> forgive me if I'm going fast, uh, basically a float is a number, okay, that contains a decimal point. I'm going to choose a color, nice and pink. FYI, I always like to comment my things with pink and pastel colors, because I think it's funny when the other engineers find it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and make a purple or something here, maybe like a blue, and I'm going to plug it in. So now everywhere on my alpha map that's white is going to be purple, and everywhere that's black is going to be pink. I'm going to go ahead and hit apply, and I'm going to look over, and there we have a little bit of something else, you know, matching my aesthetic ever so slightly more. If I wanted to not lose Ian's details from his, diffuse, uh, from his color map, I could maybe do something like by multiplying it in. Um, but first, I'm going to take all of its colors off, because I kind of don't want to multiply it by red. I just want to multiply the lights and darks. So I'm going to go ahead and use the desaturate node, desaturation, and then that will make it black and white. I can right click on any node at any time and hit start previewing node, and that's going to let me see what the node is doing. So as you can see, it took this texture and it made it black and white. And then I think I'm going to multiply just like you would in Photoshop. So multiply. I'm going to multiply this by this so that it kind of applies his textures over the top, looking a little messy. So I would yell my students for this. And save. Let's see what we got. Oh, it's too dark. Oh, no. We can fix this. Let's see. I can multiply it again by a different color. But let me show you guys the actual important parts real fast before I run out of time. Apply this. So the cool thing is that I can gain more control as the level designer or environment artist over what each individual mushroom looks like by getting my material and creating what is called a material instance, which is basically a child version of our material, which can uh, show us all of the different options that we've already created, that, such as color. I'm going to create a material instance, and I'm just going to leave the name as it is, and I'm going to drag it on. So I could open up this material instance, and you can tell that the UI is completely different. It's a lot more simplified. Let's set up some options so that I can, as the level designer, change all of these options here, change the colors and things like that. I'm going to go back to my material. Where did it go? Looks like I closed it. And I'm going to param parameterize this. Basically, when you turn something into a parameter in Unreal, you give, it editing, give us editing power over it. Um, so I'm going to be able to, as the editor, you know, change all of these colors. I'm going to right click. You can do this for anything. Right click, convert to parameter, and I'm going to call this color one. And I'm going to right click, convert to parameter, color two. And now, if I save and go back to the level, like so, get my little my child open here. Let's untab really quickly. I'm going to change the colors easily by just clicking here and switching them as I wish. So this will give you a lot of power if you want to ever you know, uh, customize things on the fly inside of Unreal. I highly recommend it. It's like two seconds of work, and it saves you so much time instead of having to, for example, create only colors in Substance Painter. So if I create multiple versions of this little mushroom, poor little guy, kind of looks like he has a disease. I'm going to duplicate this. 
apply it to the new mushroom, open it up, untab, and then I'm going to change the colors. So you see where I'm going with this. I, when I was uh, working on this project, I only had around two weekends to complete this entire, this entire level. So I had to ask myself, how do I work smart, not hard? And this is just one of the many ways that we can save a little bit of time to create some variations. For example, I used it on these little guys right here. They're all the same. I didn't have to create new textures or anything. I just was able to, um, you know, do, uh, sorry. I was just able to do this to them. So next thing on the docket is a little bit more complex, I think. Oh, yeah. Blocking out and set dressing. So that's an important part of creating a level in Unreal. So basically, the idea of blocking out, as you might imagine, is about creating the overall layout and skeleton of your model. So all I did was I took the landscape tool and I created out kind of this general shape of the level that I wanted. I had some old mushrooms in there, and I was able to flesh it out bit by bit. I work in an iterative form in which I do a little bit of everything every time I, I do an iteration. So I do a little bit of lighting, a little bit of texturing, a little bit of layout. Then I do it again and again and again better every time. Uh, so this is basically what we're looking at as the level came together, like so. Um, and we can see that I was replacing a bunch of meshes and things like that. But I still was on a super tight deadline. And I needed to figure out ways to save even more time. So that's when I cre created this tool that you can see that uses only three st uh, meshes to create a, basically an infinite amount of meshes from that. So basically, I created this mushroom tower that can be replicated infinitely with different heights, widths, sizes, colors, me meshes, shapes, and things like that. And I'm very interested in being able to show you guys today because it's actually not as hard as it might seem at least in my opinion. <laughs> All right. So let's look in here. Demo three. And this is part of our mushroom tower here. So I think I want to look at mushroom tower two. It needs to compile. But as I move it around, it will update itself and change in order for me to be able to have as many as I wish. So you can kind of just kind of keep moving them. It changes the height. Um, with colors, like I said, it changes everything. And I think this is essential. Because if I wanted to do this manually, let's say uh, it would take me forever. First, I would grab the stalk of the tower, like so, put it in place, get it just perfect, exactly the size I wanted, like so. Then I would have to find the tops, because I made this modular. So here's the two tops that we used. And I would have to like somehow stick it on there. I would have to get in really close, kind of look around, try to match these two, like so. Then if my art director was like, I don't like this shape, well, shoot, now I have to change it by replacing it here in the static mesh. And it wiggles, it changes its direction. Oh no. So now I have to come back in here and drag this on there again. Or maybe I can group them, but that doesn't help much. Um, and it won't let me edit so well. So I'm always trying to get my students to do their own tools with Unreal. That way, they can save a little bit of time. Um, and normally, they don't do it, but then they regret it after. I've always heard that. So uh, let's, let's get into it. So we're going to use a little bit of coding today, but not a lot. So let's get into uh, like blueprinting. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of blueprinting in Unreal, but it's basically a visual type of code. It uses C++. And we don't have to know any C++. That's the best part of this whole thing. To create a blueprint, you're going to right-click on the content browser and go to Blueprint Class. And I'm just going to choose. There's all these like presets for different blueprint types that we have here. Uh, so I'm going to choose just a basic actor. And I'm going to name it BP for blueprints, underscore demo mushroom tower. I always start with 0, 0, which kind of triggers a lot of people that I know. I don't know if you guys relate to that. So in here, we have our Blueprint Editor. We can do anything with this. We can create a rocket that shoots off other rockets. We can do a bear that's trying to kill you. We can do all sorts of things. But today, we're just doing a mushroom tower. Just to give you an idea, 
right here is where we have all the components of our blueprints, which is basically the sub parts. So for example, the tower itself, the mushroom top itself will all be in here. Here we're going to have some variables, uh, some functions that we can create. Um, here we have the details for everything that we selected. So if I add a uh, static mesh in here, I'll be able to change the details. Up here I can simulate it. We're not going to do that today too much. Um, but this is the viewport. Blueprint has three main parts. The viewport where you can see it come to life. The event graph, which is where you would do code that fires off during the gameplay itself. So for example, if I'm making a game, it begin play fires off whenever the game starts. Uh, we're not going to be using this because this is a tool for the editor, not for games. And we can use construction scripts, which is what we're going to be using today. Construction scripts fire inside of the editor itself without the game having to play. And also, they, um, they fire off every time this model or this blueprint has been edited in any way, which is why when I drag it, it updates. See that? So any time I change any parameter, for example, change stock heights or refresh it, I guess it's not. Oh, I should probably actually change it in here. Make it shorter, higher, whatever it will update everything. So let's go ahead and look at it. So the first thing we need to do is we need to set up all of our components inside of the viewport. I'm going to start by adding the stock that I want. Let me make sure I add the right one. So I'm going to start by adding a static mesh. Static meshes are just meshes that don't deform in any way. And I'm going to name this a stock. There's obviously nothing in here. In here, we have all the details, as usual, for everything that's selected. And I can see my static mesh is set to none, which is why I can't see it. Let me just make sure that I have the right stock. So it's right here, stocks for blueprints. All these four are the variants we're going to be using today. I'm going to select any random one. And then I'm going to go back to my blueprints. And I'm going to click this little arrow button, which will apply it. It's huge. It is a tower, after all. All right. I'm going to then apply another static mesh. Like so. Oh, it already self-applied the tower because we had it selected. So I'm going to go ahead and rename this top. That's what I'm calling like the little top of the mushroom. And I'm going to find the correct top in here. Just any of them. It doesn't matter which one because we're going to be programmatically changing it. And I'm going to apply it like so. As you can tell, they're both set to the center of the world or the center of my grid at 0, 0, 0, which is not what we want. We actually want my mushroom top to go to the top. There's obviously a problem with that. I can, if I can change the length of my tower, right, how tall it is, then I need to be able to programmatically change where this is going to snap to. Inside of the static mesh editor, which is where you can do all your static mesh options, at the beginning we saw it when I imported the little scanner. I'm going to double click that to open it. Here we have our static mesh editor. In here you can change the default material for your static mesh so that you don't have to apply it every time. You can re-import it with new settings. You can do all sorts of things. What's the most important is, is that the pivot for this is actually right here at the bottom, because I wanted it to snap to the floor. But I want there to be a second pivot at the top so that the, top, the, like the mushroom top could actually snap to it. So what I did was I added something called a socket. In Unreal, a socket is just basically a little location, like a, almost like a locator that you can apply anywhere. And you can start like, you know, using it, its information. So what I did was I went to the socket manager. Let's delete this one. You can add a socket. I'm going to call this one mushroom top socket. And it's important that you name all of the sockets on, on all of your, you know, the, for example, in this case, on all the stocks the same, because the code is going to be looking for it. So I'm going to go ahead and bring it up to where I want it, wherever I want it to snap. I'm not going to do it like, all the way to the top. I think a little bit lower is good, because then the mushroom top will be like snugly fit on there. Let me just try to center it as best as I can. And now I'm going to be able to snap the mushroom top to the socket. All right, let's go to our blueprints. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the construction script, and I'm going to go ahead and snap them. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to grab the top, and I'm going to drag it in. We can edit the properties inside of this. We can manipulate it. We can move it, scale it, all sorts of things directly in here inside of our node editor. All right. So what I want to do is I want to move this top into where the top of the tower is. I'm going to also grab the stock. And these are literally references to the static meshes that we've already created here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the location off the top of the stock so that I can apply. 
uh, so that I can just get the uh, top put on there. So I'm going to go get socket location, like so. And I'm going to make sure to type it incorrectly. One of the good things about bl blueprinting is that you don't need to type things incorrectly, except for like some small circumstances. So mushroom top socket, like so. I'm going to get its location. So basically, I'm getting the stock, getting the mushroom top, this little socket, and getting where it is. And then I'm going to take my little top and I'm going to give it a new location. So set world location, like so. These are relatively basic nodes. I like to try to keep them organized, but honestly, sometimes I can't. If you grab two nodes and you press Q on your keyboard, it actually straightens them out. Every time I bring that up in class, the students are like, oh my god. So I'm going to just connect the execution line. The way blueprints work, for those of you who don't know, is this white line is called the execution line, and it is where the, fire, the code fires off. So something needs to happen in order for the, the code to fire off, and it's going to travel from left to right into whatever little snippet of code, which is the little node, um, and then it will do whatever it says. So from here, it, whenever it updates with the construction script, it's going to move forward and set the world location on the mushroom top. I'm going to connect, I always tell my students, yellow to yellow, blue to blue. I'm going to connect the location of the socket to here. I'm going to compile, and then I'm going to try it out. So let's go put it in the world. I'm going to delete these two. Actually, they're fine. Which one am I doing today? Like so. And let's see if it will fire off. Oh my goodness, no. What did I do wrong? Let's find out. Mushroom top, top sockets. Let's see. Mushroom. Oh. <laughs> There you go. See, spelling things correctly. Sockets. Somebody spell check me, please. Let's go ahead and save this. <laughs> Did I do it wrong again? Okay, never again. There it is. So now it's going to stay together. And also, if I decide to change the length of the stock for any reason by coming in here inside of the blueprint itself, selecting the stock and manually uh, changing its size, where is it? So I'm going to do it on the Z, because the Z is up in Unreal. As I make it higher and lower, it should also make the, the top move together. So that's our first challenge down. So next, we can randomize the stock mesh, which is the most fun part. So I'm going to go ahead and take the, the mesh, and I'm going to set new meshes to it. When it comes to the execution line, I can split it, I can stop it, I can control the way it moves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to split it so that it goes to two places at once. I'm going to disconnect this by pressing Alt and clicking on it. And I'm going to add a new node called a sequence. The sequence will literally split the execution line. First, it'll do one thing, then another thing. I can add more things like third, fourth, et cetera. Basically, what we're doing here is um, we're going to make a lot of different little pieces, little baby pieces of code that all fire off together. So this one should actually come after because we want to update the shape of the stock first and then change the top. Otherwise, if we don't do it like that, if we do it the top before, it's not going to know that the, the shape ever changed. We're going to get the stock, like so, and we're going to use a new node called set static mesh. So set static mesh is going to allow us to change the actual input of the static mesh right here on that stock. I want to set it to something new. In this case, I want to randomize. But I need to random get the randomization from somewhere. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create a little list that contains all of the different stock options. All right? There's a lot of list creation in coding. For those of you who do a lot of coding, you know this. Lists in Unreal are called arrays. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add a variable, and I'm going to call this stock options, like so. And I'm going to change its type to static mesh. And now this link will be able to contain all of my static meshes, like so. I'm going to compile first. It gets mad if you don't compile. And right here, it says, make this variable a container, an array, or any other selected type. An array will let me put multiple things inside. So I'm going to compile again, and I'm going to add multiple elements, and I'm going to find all my different little stocks that were inside of my blueprint. There's four of them, so let's go ahead and put them in. So I should probably close some of that stuff. One. Let's close real fast. Let's close all this stuff because I'm getting confused. There you go. Two. Three. And one more. 
Uh, all of these have already gotten their sockets put in before? Four. So now, I have this wonderful little list that has all of these stock options for me. I can grab that list, like so, and I can drag out of it, and I can say random. So it just gra grabs a random thing from inside of my array. I'm going to plug that in, blue into the blue. So basically, the idea here is, whenever this code fires off, I'm going to connect it real quick. If you double click on the line, you can reorganize, like so. So it's going to take a random option from the side of the stock options and set it. And then it's going to move the top. Let's compile and see if, if I did everything right. If I did everything right, it should change. Oh, no. Let's see what we did. Stock options, random set static mesh. Let me check my notes real quick. So let's check if everybody's in here. Everybody's good. Stock has default settings on it. Strange. Hold up. Let me save it just in case. It wouldn't be a true Unreal demo without at least one thing going slightly wrong. Let me just make sure everybody's OK. Did I do all four? Any questions so far, by the way? I know I'm going a little fast. Going to just go ahead and put it back in, if it would let me. There you go. I don't know what it did totally wrong, but it seems to be kind of firing off sometimes when it wants to. There you go. You guys can see I did nothing different, right? <laughs> You guys are all witnesses to this, right? <laughs> OK. Maybe it was randomizing just the same one over and over again. Maybe that was our luck. We are in Vegas, after all. So there we have. And you can see that the hard parts we've already done, which is the little top moves along with the stock, which is already a huge win for anybody trying to put something together quickly inside of Unreal. All right? So let's say I want to change the stock height easily and change the shape of the top of the mushroom here. So I'm going to do that real quick by creating yet another variable. This time, it's going to control the height of the little tower. So I'm going to disconnect this, because we always have to update the top at the end. And I'm going to create a new variable. And this one's called tower height, like so. It should not be a static mesh array. In this case, we're going to use a float. Like I said, it's a number. Uh, and we're not going to make it an array. A little single one is fine. And let's set it to something by default. So let's set it to one by default. Otherwise, the tower is going to be like on the floor, un in unexistent by default. So to do that, we're going to really quickly grab the, the static mesh of the stock, and we're going to change its height. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set relative scale. Just so you guys know, there's a difference between relative and world scale. World scale, I like to say, is like north, south, east, and west. Um, and it kind of takes your scale based on the worlds or your location, whereas local space is more like right, left, front, and back, where it's like, if I turn, my right always stays in the same spot, right, in, rela in relation to me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect that. And let's go ahead and choose what scale is going to go in here. So I want the Z to change. Because in Unreal, Z is up. So I'm going to go ahead and grab my new tower height, and I'm going to put it into the Z. But it won't let me. Oh my goodness, it's turning it into a vector. I want to only change the Z. To do so, I can right click and split this vector into its three parts. And now I can apply it directly to the Z. But if I leave it like this, it's going to change the two other scales to 0, 0. And we don't want that, because it's going to be the skinniest tower ever, invisible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the existing scales for the tower already and put it in. Or I can just type in 1, 1, because I don't plan on ever creating code that will, um, that will change this. But let's say I did. I would go ahead and say get scale, like so. Make sure that you always match relative with relative. I can split this as well and then get the original x and the original y. So basically, this is already storing what the x and y were already, so we're not changing it in this case. So you can do both. Let's see if it will work 
um, on the first try. Oop, I forgot to connect the code down here. It helps to connect it. That's my number one tip for today. Let's move this. Compile. And there we have, it's not doing anything because we need to manually change the heights. In order to manually change anything inside of your blueprints, you need to make it public. You can simply click the little eyeball button right next to it, compile, and then now tower height is a variable. So I could set this to like 0 0.5 to make it shorter, or 2 to make it super long. There we go. And it will kind of move along. Looks like I parented the top to the tower itself, to the stock, which means that when I'm increasing the size of my tower, it's stretching the top. I don't want that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to unparent. Just like in any 3D software, if you parent one thing to the other and you change the parents, it's going to change the child as well. So let's go ahead and do that. Ooh, slightly offset. I wonder what I did there. Should be all good. If nothing else, I'll just parent it again. It'll all be fine. Let me make sure that this is set to 000 location. Oh, there it is. So I'm going to set this back to 000 location. Looks like we're manually changing where it goes. Just going to undo that because we're running out of time. All right. So now we have a little bit more customization going on with our work. So what else? Do I want to show you guys today? Hold up. So next thing I want to do is we can randomize so much with this. We can randomize the rotation of each element, the color, the uh, placement of it, things like that. So uh, for example, we can change the top shape, but I've already shown how to do that on the tower, so I don't think it's absolutely necessary. So let's go ahead and talk about the material, because that's my favorite part. I love to be able to change the material programmatically. So we can do something similar to what we did with Ian's mushroom, which was we created a material instance that had a parent that, ooh, it's a little messy, but basically we can you know, just create a material that uses the alpha. So let's go ahead and do that real quick, like so. So right here we have the code that's going inside of the base color. Let me actually make a brand new one. No, this is fine. So we have a base color going on here. We already have the alpha coming in. Oh, I'm on the wrong material. Hold up, guys. Sorry. Materials right here. There we go. This one's already done for us. So basically what I did was the same as the Ian's. I took the color and I desaturated it. I multiplied it. And right here, I choose an alpha to select between the purple and the red. And then I just put it right into the base color. And this will allow me to change the options inside of my material very easily. And then I can create a material instance and apply it to the little mushroom top inside of my blueprints really easily. So let me go ahead and put that on. And now we have that red and purple. It's kind of a little weird gradient, but it works for us. So let's go ahead and make this so that I can, like, by, as a level designer, easily change the material without having to apply it by hand. So inside of my construction script, I'm going to add in one last little piece of code. And I'm going to grab the top, like so. And I'm going to try to get the parameters from inside the material. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say create dynamic material instance, which makes the material dynamic. A dynamic material can change during gameplay or through programming. All right, most other materials cannot. So what that's going to do is it's going to grab the top, choose a material that's in it. Right now, I only have one material, so element zero, element zero right here. And we don't actually have to fill out the rest. I'm going to promote this to a variable, which will store it for me right here. So I'm going to call this dynamic material, like so. And now I can come in here and I can grab all the parameters. Let's see what they're called. So I have an alpha parameter, color one and color two. So what I can do is come in here to my blueprints and I can say um, set parameter. And this will set my whatever parameter I want to whatever else I might want. So scalar parameter is going to be kind of a, just a single number. 
and what I want is the texture parameter value. Texture parameter is going to be a 2D texture. And what I can do is I can choose any texture at all inside of my content browser to replace that original texture. The one we want is the, not, is it this one? Hold up. Not this one. It is this one. So I want to change the alpha first in order to change it between the blending. So I made one that has stripes on it, and I had made one that made dots on it. So what I, what I can do is I can just grab it in here, or like before, I can create a new list of texture options, because I'm going to randomize. And then I'm going to go ahead and select texture, texture 2D, like so. I'm going to turn that visible for me, turn it into a little array, and select my little textures. So this one first, wrong spot. Then this one. Let me compile this first. You always got to compile. Sorry. And last one. So now, if I select this and I get a random from inside, and I change the parameter name to match this, so it says alpha. Like so, compile, and let's see. Now we got some dots, now we got some stripes, now we got some simple gradients, and we can do so much with this kind of thing. So you can randomize the color, you can randomize the vibrancy of each color, it's, it's all in the material setup. So this is a really simple way. I know like it can look complicated and it can expand and grow, but this is a really, really simple way to get more work done faster. So I can just kind of keep dragging these out, changing its height, changing its shape, and just create an endless mushroom forest that all looks slightly different with like almost no work, just a little bit of upfront efforts. Um, with that, we basically conclude today's presentation. Thank you so much at all for coming today. Tomorrow, I'm showing how we made the modular parts of the mushrooms themselves inside mm -hmm. of ZBrush, which was super fun. All right? All Thank right, everybody. Thank you so much. Anna Carolina, give her a run. Come on, get a little more into it. It's not like you've been at a conference all day. Come on, let me feel it. Well, really, it did this. Nothing <laughs> happened afterwards. Aww. Any questions? Uh, uh, you have a moment for any questions? Anybody have a quick question out there? If you have one? Bueller, Spigoli. Dufresne. All right, that looks like it. She'll be around too, so if you have any other questions, by all means, come up. And you're presenting tomorrow, right? Was it you said? Yeah, tomorrow. tomorrow. All right. Well, please stick, stick around. We've got some more presentations happening. Thanks for coming to our booth, and uh, we'll be seeing you some more today.